There are very few experiences in life that can compete with the sensory pleasure of a good tasting cup of coffee. The combination of the intense flavor and caffeine boost is irresistible for many of us. As a result, coffee has gradually woven its way throughout Western culture and indeed most of the world. Coffee has become a part of our daily lives. This wasn't always the case though, and it's actually a fairly recent phenomena which has occurred over the past 200 years. You may have heard of the three waves of coffee that describes this process. The 1800s marked the first wave of coffee where consumer demand began to increase rapidly. Entrepreneurs saw this as an opportunity to make coffee available to a wide market. During this period saw the emergence of vacuum-packed, water-soluble coffee granules that made it much more readily available to the average person. Coffee was viewed as a commodity designed for a quick, bitter caffeine boost. The focus for producers was on high volume and consistency of taste in order to increase brand loyalty as opposed to an emphasis on quality or origin. As time passed and coffee consumption became more prevalent, so did consumer desire for increased quality. Roasters began to differentiate their product by emphasizing the different country of origin of the beans they roasted. This was the beginning of the evolution of specialty coffee. In the 1970s, the first Starbucks store famously opened and this paved the way for the cafe culture we know today. There was a fundamental shift in the way we consumed coffee. It became an experience rather than just a casual beverage you drank at home. Different brew types were available with a particular focus on espresso based drinks from beans of different origins, a dramatic shift from the homogenous soluble coffee from the past decades. Broadly speaking, dark roasted beans with a pronounced bitterness were mixed with milk amongst other ingredients such as sweetened syrups to balance the flavour. This cafe culture progressed and evolved into the early 2000s towards the third wave of coffee. There was a move away from the dark roasted and often burnt flavour of the past 30 years. Specialty coffee roasting trended towards medium and light roast levels in order to enhance the unique flavours that are inherent in the coffee bean. These inherent flavours are influenced by myriad factors such as climate, altitude, harvesting practices and so on. Beans are now sourced from specific farms as opposed to general countries. Like in any industry, this process continues to evolve over time. Lately, there has been increased attention to the minutia of the various coffee brewing techniques to help get the best taste out of the roasted coffee beans. Put simply, first wave coffee made it ubiquitous. Second wave made it an experience, third wave made it refined. I began drinking coffee in around 2008 during the crossover period between second and third wave coffee. Since cafe culture has focused predominantly on espresso based drinks, this is what I've become accustomed to drinking. I was a student at the time and this was an expensive habit, so I experimented with most of the other brewing methods that I could make coffee with at home. I certainly couldn't afford the equipment that they used in the cafes, so I didn't even consider trying. After a brief experimentation with my cafetiere and pour over, they would later sit unused and I would go back to enjoying coffee from cafes as much as I could. It hadn't actually occurred to me until fairly recently that it was actually the unique taste of espresso based drinks that kept me going back to the cafes. The intense aroma, balance of both bitterness and acidity, and the lingering aftertaste was just irresistible to me and I just couldn't replicate this experience with my other preparation methods at home. I can't be alone in feeling this way given how popular espresso based drinks have become. I don't think that it's a coincidence that most of us gravitate towards the most potent, concentrated method of coffee preparation, just like I did during my student days. More recently, I started to wonder what exactly is it that makes espresso taste so different to the other methods of coffee brewing? I also wanted to make it in the comfort of my own home and be able to offer it to any guests that came over. I perhaps naively thought that this would be a fairly easy thing to achieve. During my research, I soon realized that espresso was a far more deep and complex topic than I'd initially thought. Making it a home to the standards that I had come to enjoy wasn't going to be easy. I was a bit discouraged that most of the resources that I had found assumed that I had a level of knowledge and skill that I simply didn't possess. I was fascinated by the information but it seemed inaccessible to me and I was left with a lot of questions. How am I meant to choose from all the different types and roast levels of beans? What are all these taste notes? What machine should I buy? How much should I spend? What about the grinder? How do I troubleshoot these bad tasting shots? It was easy to draw the conclusion that this was best left to the experts. However, my desire to make good quality espresso at home was high, so I persisted. This learning experience inspired me to make my own series explaining some of the fundamentals of coffee, but espresso in particular, since I suspected other people may have faced the same issues that I have. 
I had initially thought that this information could be condensed, but when researching and writing, it became clear that it would be far too long for one video and would be better suited to a several part series breaking down the various aspects of espresso. This video series will focus less on the production of the coffee bean itself and more on the information relevant to you, the consumer at home, or even professional baristas. There will be no presumed prior knowledge, but I will get into the finer details in later videos. Coffee can be brewed in a variety of ways, such as pour over, Turkish, French press, mocha pot, cold brew, and of course espresso. In Turkish coffee preparation, a very fine powdered coffee is submerged in water and brought to the boil. With pour-over coffee, hot water is poured over a medium grind that is suspended by filter paper. With French press, a coarse grind is brewed in hot water and then pressed down with a mesh filter before serving. The mocha pot is a three-chambered design where water is placed in the bottom chamber and is heated on a stove. The steam generated increases the pressure inside the bottom chamber and water is pushed through the coffee granules in the middle chamber and brewed coffee appears in the top chamber. These brewing types all have a unique flavour profile related to the specific technique, but they share some parameters in common, one of which is a high water to coffee ratio, meaning that the brew you consume is fairly dilute. They also utilise a brewing time that takes minutes, or in the case of cold brew, hours. So what makes espresso unique? If we add espresso to the picture, we can see some clear differences in comparison to the other brewing methods. The water to coffee ratio is much lower, which results in a much more dense and concentrated beverage. The extraction is much faster, and it takes place under very high pressure, which is key to its unique flavour profile and the characteristic crema that is present in espresso. Espresso as a beverage was developed to satisfy consumer demand for a quickly available on-demand coffee and as of today is one of the most popular brewing techniques, as can be seen by the espresso machine being the focal point in most cafes. The experience of espresso is somewhat different from country to country due to local traditions and preferences. If you were to order an espresso made in the traditional Italian way, you would receive a single shot usually brewed with darker roasted beans, whereas in the UK, the amount of coffee used is normally much higher. There are some key defining features that are common to all espresso though, and that is, one, it is prepared on demand, that is, it's not pre-made and it's served to order. Two, the brew time is fast. Three, extraction takes place with heated water under high pressure. So what makes it so difficult to make balanced tasting espresso shots? The expertise required to produce a well-balanced brew is underestimated and it certainly was by me before I tried it myself. The low volume and highly concentrated brew accentuates the flaws in your raw materials, the beans and the water. In addition to this, small adjustments in brew parameters or mistakes in preparation can have a dramatic effect on the overall taste experience. Those who drink or indeed make espresso themselves will know that one cup can be overwhelmingly sweet and acidic and the next too bitter. The ideal espresso could perhaps be described as a subtle balance of aroma, taste and mouthfeel, that is, we aim to balance both broadly acidic and bitter compounds in our final brew. The difficulty is that our main way of assessing quality is a sensory experience which is inherently subjective and each consumer or barista will have their own individual preferences. So what is the role of a barista? It is often stated that if you don't want a hobby, don't try to make espresso at home. I can understand the sentiment because if you're under the illusion that you can buy a grinder, a machine and some beans and instantly make great tasting espresso, you will likely be very disappointed even if you spend a lot of money on these items. In practice, making consistently good espresso requires a methodical approach, trial and error and patience. A skilled barista takes their experience of the flavour profile of a given bean, combined with a roaster's description of the taste notes, and creates a brew with a balance of these flavours. This involves a dialing-in process where a familiar starting point is used and results are tasted and adjusted accordingly. In an ideal world, we would know the exact physical chemical properties and molecular substances that are responsible for each taste note and be able to measure them after each brew. Unfortunately, such a tool has not yet been developed. Since this is impossible, we rely on our taste to guide our adjustments. After the first extraction of a new bean, you might ask yourself questions such as does this espresso taste under or over extracted, would a stronger brew improve mouthfeel, and so on. Armed with this information, we can adjust the various parameters available to us such as grind size, temperature, dose, cup volume, brew time, and so on. This will have an effect on the next extraction process and therefore alter the taste of our subsequent brew. 
To do this effectively, you must therefore develop your palate to recognize various taste notes, but also obtain an understanding of the science behind what is happening during the extraction process. Despite an incomplete understanding of the science involved in espresso taste, what we do have is a fairly robust understanding of what happens during the extraction process. The rest of the videos in this series will be a breakdown of all the important variables when it comes to espresso preparation. After watching these videos, you will have a deeper understanding of the raw ingredients of espresso, a molecular understanding of what happens during the extraction process, the role of espresso equipment and the various extraction parameters and how they influence the overall taste of your final brew. Armed with this information, you will have maximum control over the taste and balance of your final espresso, allowing you to get the most out of your coffee beans and maximum enjoyment out of your cup. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.